The story of civilization is a story of empires. Yet, for the last several decades, we have lived in a world that is unique for its absence of empires. This is a story of the rise of two of the world's last empires, the British and the Japanese, and how centuries of tension over the nature and consequences of imperialism culminated in a war between the two that would see the end of all empires. The British Empire had its origins in the 16th century. Threatened by the Spanish Empire, England sought colonies and trade to strengthen itself. Nobles and merchants used these opportunities for personal gain, and private corporations annexed territory with little government involvement. These companies came to wield extraordinary power. Originally set up for trade, the East India Company conquered India piece by piece. First a trading post, then a region, soon the subcontinent. Once mighty Asian empires, like the Mughals in India and the Qing in China, had been weakened by internal divisions, creating an opportunity for Europeans. At its height in 1803, the company's army would be twice the size of Britain's. Stories of torture and exploitation shocked many back home. It clashed with the burgeoning ideals of a parliamentary democracy. But the empire had made Britain rich and powerful, and advances in science, industry, and economics led many Europeans to believe that they had been singled out by providence to civilize the world, by force if necessary. The empire became a validation of a deep conceit. By the 1800s, losing the empire had become unthinkable to many. When India mutinied, Britain stepped in and took direct control. It moved into Burma, Malaya, and Africa, forced China to cooperate. By 1900, they ruled over a quarter of the world's population. Britain's effect on India was profound. They destroyed its traditional economy and exploited its people. They banned widow burning and child marriage, created postal, telegraph, and rail services, albeit for British interests. British rule created new groups and new opportunities in India. Missionaries opened schools, jobs as bureaucrats, lawyers, and doctors opened up, newspapers were started, novels written. With these changes, a new national identity began to form. Tired of being second-class citizens in their own country, a political party, the India National Congress, was started to advocate for self-rule. Mohandas Gandhi became its most influential member. He was a lawyer who, like many Congress members, was educated in Britain. He thought of himself as a British subject until being thrown off a train in South Africa for daring to sit in the whites only first class carriage. From then on, he dedicated his life to fighting for Indian rights. <laughs> In India, he called for Satyagraha, peaceful protests aimed at exposing to the British the truth of their rule. But these protests often turned to riots, and the British response was often brutal. In 1919, at Amritsar, soldiers fired at peaceful protesters, killing hundreds. Shocked by these events, many in Britain, such as the Labour Party, began to question the empire and its civilizing mission. But Britain's racial and national prejudice was deeply rooted, and most still believed that India wanted and needed Britain. Two politicians would represent this change, Clement Attlee and Winston Churchill. Attlee had once celebrated the empire, but after spending time fighting poverty in London, and traveling throughout India as a member of parliament, he began to feel that the empire had taken a wrong turn. In 1935, he would become leader of the Labour Party and push for greater freedom for India. Churchill, the future wartime leader of Britain, 
would spend the 1930s belligerently denying India any chance of independence. By the late 1930s, the National Congress had made great strides, but it seemed as if the Raj could last for many more years. Germany and Japan changed everything. In 1853, U.S. Navy Commodore Matthew Perry marched into Edo, the capital of Japan. He put on a display of power in hopes of opening up Japan to trade. Having seen what the British had done to China, Japan had little choice but to agree. Feeling humiliated, pride in their military shattered, the Japanese set out to learn from the West in order to beat it. In astonishing time, they modernized themselves. In 1904, Japan defeated Russia in the Russo-Japanese War. An Asian nation defeating a European power was unprecedented. The victory gave people all over Asia some hope of freeing themselves from European domination. But in Japan, an ultra-nationalist military faction had other ideas. They advocated for military rule, expansionist policies, and the superiority of the Japanese race. Economic troubles had pushed many citizens to sympathize with the militarists' extreme ideas. In a series of coups, such as the murder of Prime Minister Inukai Tiyoshi, the militarists took control of the government. Few Japanese opposed these actions, and a new atmosphere of total obedience to the state was now expected from Japanese citizens. Japan was a resource-poor nation, and only 12% of its land was arable. To overcome this problem and become a great power, it would have to follow the example of the West and acquire colonies. Japan took Korea, Formosa, and Manchuria from China, but it wasn't enough. In 1937, Japan invaded the Chinese heartland. Because Japanese soldiers were routinely beaten and humiliated by their superiors, stripping them of their humanity, and because they were told the Chinese were subhuman and could be easily defeated, the war would see some of the worst atrocities in history. In Nanking, they raped and killed at an unprecedented speed and scale. The executions became so monotonous they made games of it. Girls as young as 10 were raped and mutilated. But the atrocities only made the Chinese people more resilient, and Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek was unwilling to surrender, no matter the cost. As Hitler's war machine was sweeping through Europe, the Japanese became stuck in China, and there was more problems on the horizon. The war needed oil, and America supplied it. But President Franklin Roosevelt stopped the shipments, putting Japan in a bind. Without the oil, they wouldn't be able to hold their new empire. They looked to the Dutch East Indies and its oil supplies. To take it would risk war with Britain and the USA. They formulated a plan. If they could take over the fortress city of Singapore and put the US Navy out of commission, it might give them the time needed to consolidate their conquests in the Pacific. It was a huge gamble, but the leaders of Japan were gambling men. December 1941. The Japanese strike at Pearl Harbor, invade the Philippines, Hong Kong, and Malaya. The British were stunned. Using bicycles, the Japanese stormed through Malaya. Any illusion left the British were a military power went up in flames. Despite no special training, the Japanese quickly mastered jungle warfare. The British thought them unbeatable and retreated. A 19th century idea unsuited to the modern world, the fortress city of Singapore turned out to be a joke. Fearing for the lives of its civilians, 100,000 British soldiers would surrender to just 25,000 Japanese. Churchill would call it the worst defeat in British history. Those who could fled to India, a thousand mile retreat full of exhaustion, disease, and starvation. 10,000 died, 
but it was the Indians, Malays, and Burmese who really suffered. Abandoned by the British to a terrible fate at the hands of the Japanese, those captured were forced to march in brutal conditions into labor camps. The Japanese didn't believe in the Geneva Convention, and many were worked to death. There was panic in India as the Japanese approached, but in May 1942, close to the border of India, the Japanese had pushed as far as they could. Both sides settled in and shifted their focus. Without ever being consulted, Indians were told they were at war. Opinions were split. Many soldiers and volunteers seeing the war as just remained loyal. Others saw the Axis as potential liberators and joined them. Nehru, the new leader of Congress, saw freedom through Britain as the best way to avoid chaos. But Gandhi saw no reason to fight the war and pushed for the immediate withdrawal of Britain. British Parliament sent Stafford Cripps to negotiate with Congress. He promised self-rule in exchange for cooperation. But forces on both sides undermined the negotiations, and India rose up in the Quit India movement. Because of the number of British troops in India, it was doomed to fail, and ended with Congress imprisoned. But worse was yet to come for India. With the loss of Burma and an unstable market, Food became scarce, and exacerbated by a slow and callous reaction from Britain, famine broke out killing millions. But with these events, India had turned a corner. It would fight the war and form the largest volunteer army in history. But there was now an expectation of freedom across India. The condition of that freedom would be determined on the battlefield. The war for Burma is one of the most fascinating in history. The Japanese would face men from all over the British Empire. Britons, Indians, Burmese tribesmen, Nepalese Gurkhas, East and West Africans, as well as Americans and Chinese. There was tension between the Allies on its purpose. Because of the difficulty of supplying China from the air, Roosevelt's main concern was securing a land route to China and had no interest in keeping the British Empire afloat. Roosevelt and Churchill had met in 1941 to sign the Atlantic Charter, a universal declaration of freedom and self-determination for all nations. But when pressured on applying these principles to the empire, Churchill backtracked. An old-school imperialist, he wanted the empire back in British hands before the end of the war. The man in charge of retaking Burma was William Slim, leader of the newly created 14th Army. Slim, known as Uncle Bill to the troops, was one of the finest generals Britain ever produced. The Burma theatre was not considered a high priority by the British, who faced a more immediate threat from Germany. Yet, despite limited resources, Slim would spend the next two years transforming the demoralized soldiers into a formidable fighting force. He had a blunt, down-to-earth manner that inspired loyalty. He showed them what they were fighting for, fostered a hatred of the Japanese, and broke the myth of their invincibility. By early 1944, the Japanese were losing the war. The battles of Midway and Guadalcanal had turned the tide. American forces were pushing towards Tokyo, island by island. The Japanese needed a victory, and they looked to Burma. They believed they could beat the British again and stop the supplies to China, maybe even cause a revolution in India. But desperation had made them blind to the risks. Mutaguchi, leader of the 15th Army, was eager for glory, surrounded himself with sycophants, and typical of the Japanese militarists, he believed that will could overcome all material weakness. With no air power and no supplies, he would gamble with 60,000 lives to prove it. The brunt of the Japanese attack was aimed at Imphal, but it was at Kohima that the fate of India would be decided. 
the hills around Kohima offered control of the vital supply road. To avoid starvation, the Japanese needed to beat the British and take their supplies. It would fall to just 2,500 men, a thousand of whom were non-combatants, to defend Kohima against 15,000 Japanese. A loss at Kohima could have had drastic consequences for India. With British authority undermined, India could have descended into chaos or seen an invasion by Japan and its Indian allies. Britain may have been drawn into a bloody civil war to regain control of India. Totally encircled by the Japanese, Kohima became a siege. The defenders had no water supply, no barbed wire, nowhere safe to put the wounded, and no idea when reinforcements would arrive. Supplies had to be dropped by air, but frequently landed in enemy territory. Fighting was often hand to hand, and most attacks took place at night. Sleep was short, and fatigue took a heavy toll on men's minds. The once lush forest was shattered and stripped bare, and a horrific smell hung over the battlefield. A mixture of sweat, feces, and bug-infested corpses. The Japanese chipped away at the British defenses relentlessly, until the British position was just 300 meters across but air power proved decisive. And on the 20th of April, after two weeks, reinforcements broke through. The now starving Japanese would prove their reputation as skilled defenders, taking a further two months to dislodge from Imphal and Kohima. The men had survived one of the most brutal battles of the war and turned the tide. Sadly, their achievement would be largely forgotten overshadowed by the invasion of Normandy that same month. As the Japanese retreated through Burma, men fell in their thousands, bodies forever lost to the jungle. The campaign was the worst defeat in Japanese military history. Of the 60,000 who participated, 30,000 died, 7,000 at Kohima, and a further 23,000 were wounded. Slim went on to chase the Japanese out of Burma. The British Old Guard saw a chance to re-establish the Empire. But in its victory, the Empire had only allowed itself a more peaceful end. The defeats of the early war had proven that Europeans were not all-powerful, and fighting the war had shown the people of Asia what they were capable of. The price for their sacrifice would be independence. Many people like Churchill couldn't see the world had changed and hoped to keep the empire. But after the fall of Berlin, elections were held in Britain. In a moment that stunned the world, Labour leader Clement Attlee would win a landmark election. Churchill was a man of grand visions, more interested in Britain's place as a world power than the concerns of its people. Attlee, on the other hand, had better understood what people really wanted. The election was representative of changing priorities in the West. Opinions of the empire varied, but British soldiers like the citizens back home were tired of the old world, tired of taking orders. They fought for more than the empire. They fought for a vision of the future. They wanted something good to come from the long years of war and were resentful of the politicians that had allowed the war to happen. Plans to retake Malaya were underway when the combination of the atomic bombs and Soviet invasion forced Japanese surrender. Attlee would go on to see the transformation of Britain. National health, national insurance, and the nationalization of key industries. Attlee's and later cabinets tried to keep some semblance of empire, but the tide of nationalism was too strong. 
India and Pakistan would gain independence in 1947, Burma in 48, Malaya in 57. As with the partition of India, the birth of these new nations was sometimes fraught with violence and instability. But never before had an empire dissolved itself, a testament to those who worked to change opinions. The United States and Soviet Russia would emerge from the war as superpowers. Both opposed traditional empires, and holding all the cards would hasten its demise. But in their ideological struggle with one another, each would use its military, economic, and cultural influence to force countries to behave in ways they found acceptable, actions sometimes reminiscent of the empires they condemned. The United States would occupy Japan until 1952. Ironically, in trying to secure itself from Westerners, it had allowed them even greater control. Many in Japan would use the bombing of Japan to frame themselves as the victims of the war, rarely discussing the imperialist ambitions and atrocities that led to those actions. Year by year, the empires of Europe would disintegrate. Britain would struggle to find its place in the new order. Once a colossus that bestrode the world, its people struggled to once again be a small island nation of little prestige. Its legacy is difficult, exploitative, racist, oppressive, but it marshaled its empire to fight totalitarianism, and whether intentional or not, it helped spread democracy, science, and a belief in human rights all over the world.